Okay, is everyone coming in? Hey everyone, welcome. Hey guys. Hey, Laura, how you doing? Hey, everyone. <clears throat> we'll just give everyone a minute to come in before we begin. Hey, Laura. Hi, Craig. Hope you've all got a coffee or some lunch, maybe. I'm actually a bit hungry. I wish I'd brought some lunch. Yeah, I just thought of that as well. <laughs> all I have is an empty coffee cup. <laughs> or gin. Laura suggested gin. I think that's probably what we all want. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be nice. We just change this. We just change this to a gin drinking party. <laughs> it's Friday. I'm sure it's five o'clock somewhere, isn't it? <laughs> it was that actually gin you're drinking, Ross? Um, yeah, you put it in water glass and no one asked questions. <laughs> oh, that uh, that creepy thing has happened, Ross. Hold up your glass. Branded content. We both so, stole the same glass from the same pub. That's that very, is kind of crazy. I blame my flatmate. <laughs> Actually, saw a good thing on like last night. You just uh, you put the little so someone put the little tea, you know, the tea string over the edge, and you just tape it on the inside, and then just fill your cup with beer. <laughs> and no one has any idea that you're drinking beer. Cool. So we've got about 80 people joined at the moment. We've had about 230 people. So we'll just set a little uh, register to, for the event. Um, so we'll let it run just a little bit more, just make sure everyone's in and then we'll get started. We'll start at 12.05. So if anyone needs a wee toilet break, feel free to run away just now. Or wants to go to the kitchen to get gin. I might well treat myself to one afterwards. So, feeling like a gin day. <clears throat> hey, Michael. Long time no see. Hope you're, hope you're well. Cool. Well, I'm just going to get started, everyone. So uh, welcome and thanks for taking this hour out of your day to join us. Um, my name is Andrew Doby. Uh, I'm the founder of Made Brave. Um, today we've also got Mark Cullen, who is our head of strategy, um, as well as Ross McDonald, who's a strategist at Made Brave. And we also have Keenan, our brand manager at Made Brave. So there's four of us here to help you guide you along this session. For those who are new to Made Brave and don't know who we are, uh, we are a creative brand agency. We're based out in Glasgow's East End. Um, skip a slide, Mark. It's always hard. We also have a content agency over in uh, Edinburgh called Campfire. And it's, it's very difficult when, when, you're not, when you're not clicking the buttons, isn't it? Um, and we've recently been named um, the Drums Top 100 Independent Agencies in the UK and also uh, Campaign Magazine's Best Place to Work winner. So we're very proud of that. We generally work with um, a lot of these brands that you see on the screen as clients. Um, and so we have a huge sort of expertise or wide expertise um, across lots of different industries, lots of different sectors. Um, our... Studio um, is over here in, in Glasgow. Um, we're missing dearly. We literally just um, renovated and moved into a new studio out in the east end of Glasgow. Um, if you want to see a little bit more of that, you can jump onto our site. Um, we share a lot of content about that. Um, and, you know, as a team, we've got just under 50 people um, across Made Brave and Campfire. We've got all sorts of 
brand and marketing specialists, um, designers, copywriters, animators, um, filmmakers, um, and all the kind of, I suppose, other, other roles in between project management, account management, and so on and so forth. Um, what I'm going to do is just give you a quick overview of today's session um, and let you know what we're going to be going through. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction and then Mark and Ross will be guiding us through the rest of the session. Keenan is here, as I mentioned, to support. Uh, he also has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to brand and um, we, we'll all be available for the Q&A at the end of this. So if you have any questions for any of the four of us, we'll be happy to take them. So pop them in the Q&A box, which is down, down here somewhere. Um, if you pop them in there, basically you can then upvote the best questions and then we'll do our best to get through as many of them as possible. We will try and keep this to an hour. Um, uh, where possible because um, you'll all be very busy at this time I'm sure so um, you know I suppose like like you all you know us here at Made Brave we're trying to figure out um, our way through this whole thing and I think you know we can pretty pretty much all agree that it's, it's challenging and scary for us all um, I'd be lying if I you know if I told you that my anxiety levels haven't been through the roof recently um, you know I think each day each hour seems to bring a new challenge of some sort something that we're not expecting um, and you know from my perspective it's, it's been really nice to see you know communities coming together people coming to support each other um, we built out a community on LinkedIn for the creative industry. So if you're in the creative industry, we have a creative industry COVID support group on there um, where people are helping each other out and pointing each other to, to loans and grants as they all become available. Um, you know, and, and I suppose we all have different scenarios playing out in our own lives and our own businesses. And you know, each of our stories are, are very different. Um, and, you know, remember, if you're struggling at all, um, to reach out and ask for help. You know, there's lots of um, great help out there. Again, if you're in the creative industries, if you have a look at NABS, N-A-B-S, um, that's a free, a free charity with lots of support for people in the creative industry. Um, but, you know, please do make sure and speak to people if you're, if you're struggling. Um, you know, I read something nice the other day, um, I think on LinkedIn, um, it said, you know, we're all in the same storm. However, we're just all in different boats, you know. So, um, you know, as I say, those scenarios are playing out differently for everyone. So, you know, we all have challenges, remember, and be kind to, to one another. Um, now, of course, you know, the, these challenges we're all facing are not only in our hometowns. You know, the whole world's been affected. Um, and, you know, I think we've all started to realise how fragile everything is that we, you know, that we've built, um, you know, and... I suppose, you know, talking back to the, you know, the anxiety that we're all feeling, um, you know, anxiety can have negative effects, but, it, you know, also has a purpose. I suppose anxiety is there to protect us from home. Uh, I read an article that, you know, a psychologist Rollo May wrote in 1977, you know, that, you know, as humans, we're no longer, you know, leading, um, sorry, we're no longer prey to uh, tigers and mastodons to, to damage our self-esteem and exclusion from society or groups. Um, you know, uh, anxiety has changed, but the experience and the, the feelings um, that we get are exactly the same as before, you know. So we're no longer chased by predators, but we're, you know, in certainty about health for the loved ones, you know, whether we'll have a job next week or, you know, next year, you know, um, and, and these all evoke the same neurological and physical responses. But, you know, as I mentioned, anxiety isn't useless, uh, you know, in an an economic crisis, anxiety helps us, you know, you know, um, keeps us up at night and, you know, may help us fathom a solution to, to keeping our businesses open. But left unchecked, obviously saps us and drains our energy and drives us to make poor decisions. Um, so, you know, I don't know about you guys, but when, you know, when I have, you know, a plan or even the resemblance of a plan, um, my anxiety seems to take more of a back seat. So, um, you know, the, the, the trick at the moment, however, is not to stick to plans just because we created them um you know uh, i think you know more than ever ever we have to use we have to create guides and, and then we have to figure out how do we adapt and we're adapting daily you know by the hour or by the week um so none of us know what's coming um so unfortunately if you've joined in today you know we, we don't have a prediction for what's coming um we have no idea and and of course we don't proclaim to have the answers um to everything um but not knowing what's coming um, doesn't mean we shouldn't plan, right? And, you know, for those that have children, um, I suppose it's like when you're planning for a child uh, to arrive, you literally have no idea what is coming, but you have to plan for the unexpected. And I suppose, you know, we are at Made Brave, we're having to adapt our service offering. You know, a lot of, um, like, like you all are, you know, a lot of clients have been affected. Our, our work as normal has, has changed. And, and, and rather than wait around, you know, we've been working um, on what a, a useful service offering looks like, you know, to businesses, to, to, to people just now. Um, 
Um, you know, and, and so as part of this series, you know, we, we do have a new service offering that we want to share with you all. Um, it's not for everyone, um, but we want to talk a little bit about that today um, after our session. Um, but the, the hope really for this session is to, 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 to spark some conversations, to hopefully inspire you in some way or another and maybe set you off on a different path. Um, and we're going to do our very best to leave you with as much valuable value sorry, as, as, as we can for this um, throughout this session. So anyone um, that's joining, um, just to uh, mention what I mentioned at the beginning, we have a Q&A box at the, at the bottom and we will be having a Q&A at the, the end. So any questions you have, don't, you know, if you're thinking them, probably someone else is thinking them, so pop them down there and we'll, we'll be sure to answer them if we can at the end. So I'll pass you over to Mark and Ross who are gonna guide you through this next session and I'm gonna have a wee drink of my coffee. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and uh, we want to start this with a big fat proviso, a massive asterisk, um, that uh, we are not fortune tellers. We, we, uh, we are all passengers in this. <laughs> and um, the, the, the truth is, in terms of the, the way the six month, and the, I could not have predicted the speed with which things moved in March. Uh, and uh, I don't think anyone could have predicted all of the, the, the details of the last two weeks, let alone what the next six months and nine months are gonna look like. Um, so please take all of this as our thoughts. This is, our, this is where our heads are at. And we think that, that knowledge is best when it is shared um, uh, rather than just kind of siloed out. Um, and a particular importance is um, I, I, I was sort of sense checking what we were going to say and I was asking myself difficult questions on it. And for me, one of the really important things that I wanted to flag right up front is that this is not a one size fits all way of thinking, that there is no silver bullet for how we are going to approach the next six months and nine months and 12 months because every single sector and every single business have their own circumstances and are totally unique. Um, so what this is, um, and this is a quite an important way of kind of kicking this off, is um, this is a, an approach, this is a way of thinking. Um, what this is, we cannot advise you right now on a webinar um, how to solve your unique and distinct business challenges. That's just not what webinars are here for. But what we can do is tell you where we would start to help and where, and, and so the best way that, that I would kind of describe what it is we're doing here to rather than kind of manage expectations is we are not going to be answering an awful lot of the what individual businesses need to do to survive and to thrive for the next 12 months. But what we can do is advise how they can start answering those questions because every single answer for every single business will be totally different and totally unique for you. Um, and I think, uh, and Ross, you wanted to have a chat about the way to start that is with a mindset. Yeah, I think um, just to sort of like build on your point a little bit as well. Um, it's, yeah, we can't tell you what your business should do right now in a webinar. We also can't tell you what exactly is going to happen next. And I think you see a lot of that at the moment. You, you see every, like, that's what everyone wants to know. And certainty is the big thing at the moment. And everyone's trying to solve it. And um, every newsletter you get through, every post on LinkedIn, every marketing and every market research company is trying to predict that. Um, and I saw a headline from, from YouGov yesterday, and I, I do love YouGov, I think they're great, um, but I thought the, the particular headline uh, said something like, Brits will spend more on eating out after lockdown. Um, so they're predicting the future based on the survey they've done, um, but I think that's a little bit misguided because we know that just asking people about their behaviour um, doesn't necessarily mean that is what they're going to do. Um, but we can approach this, even though we don't know what's going to happen, we, we have to sort of approach it in some way. Um, and we've been thinking a lot about how we do that, how you sort of constructively approach this challenge um, sort of for ourselves and also more importantly for our clients. Um, uncertainty is the big thing, um, but there are signals there in that noise that you can sort of use as a grounding point and a starting point to build your thinking on. Um, the first place that we always go is the, the sort of real solid um, marketing science, what, what should you do in 
um, in a recession in, in a downturn like this in order to keep your brand afloat. afloat. Um, and the sort of traditional mindset, the, the research is definitely there and it's pretty robust and it says to an extent, try and spend your way out of re recession. Now, I think that's probably an obvious thing um, that you would expect marketing thinkers and marketing agencies to say. Um, it's self-serving for them, they, they, they need to stay in business as well. Um, but it's also backed up by a lot of sort of harder research behind there, the likes of the IPA, these sort of publications, um, they are, they're built on sort of years of study, really solid data, and there's definitely a rationale for spending if you can. But I think what we've also seen um, recently is a lot of those sort of top thinkers coming out and saying, well, actually, should you be doing that? Is that a blanket? Um, way to deal with it for all brands and the obvious answer to that is no you can't just take um, spending as being the one way out for everyone because you have to survive and marketing is an investment but that investment uh, means nothing if you can't get through the next few months and the next few years um, and it's quite clear that this downturn is quite different from some of the recessions we've had before um, the numbers coming out of the uh, the UK government at the moment is um, like recessions usually two three percent dip in, in GDP. They're predicting this, at least in the short term, could be twenty five percent. So we're talking orders of magnitude uh, difference in in what this could look like economically. And there's also a lot of talk about behaviourally how things will change. That's something we're going to talk about a bit more um, in a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think really. We're trying to tread that line between the two and say there's definitely merits in, in both of those line of thoughts, um, but you do have to sort of come down somewhere on that. Yeah, and, and just to jump in, we, me and Ross in our uh, strange strategy uh, Zoom rooms, uh, uh, we've had the arguments on this, um, that there's a really good argument for bunkering down right now, uh, particularly if your business is in crisis mode. You're doing those emergency cash flow projections. You're getting every piece of funding you can possibly get. So whether you're a marketer or whether you're a business, there is, there's a moment that we all had to go through in March or February and April. Um, but as we've moved through, and as particularly the nature of this journey that we're all on is now beginning to change, um, as a team, we've come down on one side now and we, we think that it's not as simple as saying spend your way out versus uh, bunker down and hide away. We think that there is a middle ground between the two where you can, uh, where you can invest, but you can do it in such a way that is careful and that is strategic. But fundamentally, and this is the mindset that we are adopting right now, and this is the mindset that we are talking to our clients about, and this is the mindset that we are trying to now share with others within the marketing community and within businesses, is that, yes, things may well continue to get bad. You know, this may be the eye of the storm right now, whilst we're all still on lockdowns in, in our gardens, and there may well be a very difficult few months ahead. Um, but if you take the mindset as a marketing department, and it is obviously the job of, of marketing and brand and digital to create value and create business, if you take that mindset of negativity, then it's, you're not setting the rest of your business up for what could be potentially a very positive future. And the way that, the way that we've articulated this is that you have to plan for acceleration. Um, and we, we've, we talked to clients about it just in the last few weeks, and they are receptive to it, particularly now, that if you are hoping for an autumn boom, and if you even need an autumn boom to make up for losses in April and in March, then you can't just sit back and rest on your laurels and wait for that boom to happen. You have to facilitate it. You have to make that boom happen. Um, and it may well be the case that there is not a boom. It may well be the case, and I think we're all analyzing those models, that the economic flow of this depends massively on what sector you are in. And so that's the way we are approaching the services that we are now developing, which is to say that 
as marketers, you need to be on the front foot. You have to now try and accelerate your way out of this. So if you had to choose between those two models, we are leaning more towards invest. Um, and so where we wanted to take today was as a bit of a guide as to how, and it's a process that we've gone on to try and advise how we can work through this. And um, these are tips. They are 10 pieces of advice that we've been applying to ourselves, we've been applying to our clients, and over the next few weeks, we are going to be advising to as many other people as possible. Um, some of these, I should point out, um, are maybe a little obvious, but that's okay, that's fine. Um, and they are just our approach, like I said before. They're not the, this is not Bible, this is not gospel. These are just the way that we are approaching things. And then after we work through these 10, we'll run you through how we've actually structured that into a process for our, for our clients. So um, at number one, me and Ross will bounce between the two of us when we, we talk these through. Um, the first of these is we talked about there not being a one size fits all. That is 100% true because every single sector is different. Um, if you are in the travel industry right now, you are looking at a very different journey through this as opposed to if you're selling toothpaste or you're selling paint. Um, and it's, it's, it's not too obvious to point out that you have to take an in-depth look at your individual sector that you are working on and map that individual journey. There's only so much of Financial Times, there's only so much of McKinsey reports you can read when they are looking at things at a very, very high altitude. Um, in fact, some of the really good reports that we've been buying into, there's, a, there's some previewed on the screen just now, they do these deep dives into individual sectors. And then when you then deep dive into the individual markets within each sector, that's where you get some real valuable insight as to what your individual journey is going to look like. Because you're not going to get a clear and accurate picture of the way your journey, of the way your client's journey is gonna map out by looking at things at a high altitude. And it may well be the case as well that no action is the best action. Doing nothing might be that best strategy. And we're gonna talk about timing a little bit later on as well. So number one for us is stop looking at things from 30,000 feet. In a way, it's not the BBC News website you need to be looking at. It's diving into individual sector reports and individual markets within those sectors to try and understand how that journey is gonna work for you because it will be very, very dependent on your sector. And an aspect of that, which, I mean, this is Marketing 101. Um, this is no, you know, this is not a headline thing to take away from today, but my God, it's important. Um, I I we do an awful lot of audience research and market research. We do an awful lot of personas and pen profiles and not in the lot. And I, I, and I hate to break it to you, as a lot of you already know, a lot of them are out of date. Um, it doesn't mean that those audience insights won't come back. And it doesn't mean that all audience insight needs to go into the bin. But what it does mean is that we are all fundamentally different in the way that, that we're living our lives right now. And it's likely given what your client is, who your client is and what they sell, it's likely that their purchase behavior may well have shifted. It's likely that their attitudes towards certain things may well have changed. And keep in mind that what we're talking about here in this roadmap is only really for the next kind of six to nine months. If you take things within that framework, you have to start listening again to your audience. You have to start doing that audience research again. Now, that doesn't have to be a huge expense. It doesn't have to be hugely expensive. We, we do an awful lot of social listening and it's actually really good value, um, but you've got to be investing in that. And, uh, and that is an ongoing thing too, because it's kind of what Ross was talking about there with YouGov. If you do audience research right now, that's great. But think about that journey. If you're learning about what they're thinking right now, but you're going to be relaunching in July, September, you need to be thinking about what they're going to be thinking about then. So it's a very complicated picture. So essentially, you have to start audience research and you have to start listening again in any way that you can find affordable in any way you can. Yeah, so that all sounds pretty scary. <laughs> so I'm going to try and give a little bit of uh, an antidote to that, a starting point, um, because clearly a lot will change, but some things won't change um, because we're humans. We're built up over 
hundreds and thousands and millions of years to act in certain ways and respond to things in particular ways. So something that we started doing is to say, flip it on its head, when everyone's talking about what's changing, yes, that's very important, you have to take it into account. But in order to start to interpret that, um, first of all, ask what hasn't changed? Um, because a lot of things won't change and a lot of things will rebound back to what they were before. Um, you've got a lot of um, the sort of big thinkers, the likes of Mark Ritson, sort of saying things like, um, yes, the current uh, COVID-19 effect is massive and the structural impacts, but these impacts will su subside and will not change things forever. Um, we'll go into recession, that is all. The consumer culture slash market will not go through the same mind-changing transformation. Um, I love Mark Ritson, I think he's great. Um, I think he's really good at being sort of 80% right because there, there is a debate around uh, this. Um, and um, if this recession is deep enough, if it is sort of has a psychological effect that is great enough, then it could change behavior. Um, big events in history do change behavior and pandem pandemics can get pretty big. Uh, so from my point of view, I'm gonna be paying attention probably as much to what the historians are saying about what's happened in similar situations before as to what uh, the marketing guys are saying. Um, but just uh, going on to the next slide, Mark. Um, we've got our, our, our man who's hurtling towards apparently becoming a trillionaire at the moment. So he's, he's doing better than most. Um, but he says something quite similar that I very frequently get the question, what's going to change in the next 10 years? I almost never get the question, what's not going to change? And that's really important because you, you need to build your, your business foundations um, to be flexible, to be sustainable, particularly in a time like this. Um, if we just react to the one thing that's going to change for a short amount of time, then yeah, we might get ourselves out of a, a jam for a couple of months, but then you're going to be back in, uh, back in the hole after that flash in the pan has happened. Um, I wouldn't be recommending investing in toilet paper, for example, because that's just going to go back to normal. So how do you deal with that? Um, I think this, this sort of big reveal um, here for us uh, in our process is scenario planning. Um, scenario planning is something that's sort of a core part of strategy across every domain, across financial planning, across uh, military planning, um, across any other number of fields. But it seems to be something that's sort of quite regularly forgotten in marketing for some reason. Um, we tend to go down this sort of um, double funnel approach of there's one way to go um, and, and then you execute that. Um, but that's not really going to work at this sort of time when there is so much uncertainty out there. Um, but it is a sort of way to sort of stop that paralysis because uncertainty is paralysis. We know that as people um, and give us sort of a framework to work with. Um, and yeah, you can see sort of um, the likes of McKinsey doing this as well. They've got their models there on the, the right hand side of the different ways that, that this, um, this recession could, um, could occur, whether it's going to be the sort of V-shaped one or whether it's going to be a bit longer lasting. Um, but they can sort of put a bit of percentages to that um, and, um, and try to create an idea of where you could be going um, in different ways. And once you've mapped some of those scenarios and you've begun to uh, figure out what the, the worst case scenario is, maybe probably the more likely case scenario is, um, what a lot of businesses are now doing. Uh, which is great, including us, is they are beginning to innovate their service offering. Uh, I think that was where we were probably about a month ago, maybe six weeks. How fast things are moving is hilarious. But about kind of a month ago, everyone was suddenly going, new world, right, we have to, we can't just sell what we were selling before. We have to now sell something new. And broadly, that's great. That's good. Um, but there's, there is also fraught with problems and with potential risk. So on the one hand, it's very easy for people like us to say, hey, you need to innovate what you do, you need to pivot. Yeah, but if you make chocolate bars, don't, don't start making soap. You know, there is a natural pivot which most companies need to do. And that's very easy to say in a webinar. It's very hard to say when you're in a workshop with a client, you're trying to figure out what that pivot is. Um, and a piece of advice that we've picked up uh, on this is from uh, one of the one of the 
the, the dark lords of, of internet marketing, uh, um, Simon Sinek, um, who came to fame with his circles within circles and, and focusing businesses on why as opposed to what. Brilliant, he's made a lot of money from it and we put it in a lot of our keynotes. Um, but he has, a, he has evolved that over the past few weeks. Um, and it's a, it's a really good piece of advice that we wanted to pass on, which is as marketers, for the last 10 years, 15 years, we've been talking to clients about purpose and the power of purpose rather than necessarily just what businesses do. If you, if you or your clients are now beginning to pivot and you're now beginning to figure out what it is you need to do, don't just chase the money. Don't just chase the what you want to do. Root that pivot in your purpose, in your why. Make a values-based decision rather than purely a financial one. Because otherwise, you will make mistakes similar to the ones that were made, for example, in the late 90s in the dot-com boom, where a lot of businesses suddenly saw the internet and went, hey, this is amazing. We're now going to venture off and do things. And it was one of the things which distorted that economy, is that people were doing things that they were not specialized in doing. And as a result, people also didn't trust those businesses to do it. And out of that came the likes of Amazon, who are specialists. Um, and a nice example of that actually is some activity that BT have been doing over the past few weeks is they've realized that, to be honest, BT are not, are not one of those businesses that are struggling right now. We're all upgrading our broadband, we're all watching more television, but they have focused um, a lot of their outgoing uh, community work and a lot of their outgoing comms work around their core purpose, which is, which is connecting people. And through connecting people, they've realized that something they, something they needed to pivot to do is offer advice and not just take people's money, but help them communicate better. That's a really nice example of pivoting, not just going where the money is, but going where their heart is. And it's, a, it's just a little tweak on that innovation theme that we're all pushing to our clients just now. And a kind of a adjunct to that, um, which... This is actually one of my favorites uh, in any kind of list of top tens. There's always ones that stand out. And this for me is, is a great one. Um, I don't know about you, but it's occurred to most of us, how the hell have Zoom done this? I mean, a year ago, we would Skype people and suddenly it's now totally different. And a lot of, no doubt, endless marketing papers will be written on that. Um, but there was a, an interesting piece of advice that we'd read recently, which, which we sort of evolved and played around with. And it's, don't obsess on being unique through this. If you're evolving your product offering, if you're trying to pivot yourselves or your clients, don't obsess on trying to think up something totally new because it's almost impossible to do that. Focus on just being slightly better. Just focus on tweaking a service and finding one aspect of it which frustrates. Perhaps just communicate it better. It's the classic Apple model of doing what other people have done, but do it slightly better, market it better, brand it better, sell it better, make it easier to sell, make it easier to buy even. That is how you actually steal a march through product innovation a lot of the time. You don't try and think up something new. Because to be honest, if you were going to think it up, you probably would have thought it up by now. So that focus that we can bring to our businesses and our clients is around just nudging them to do better than their competition. And if you get it right, and a lawful lot of this is luck, you could find yourself in a position where that growth is organic rather than forced. That people will come to you rather than you having to push yourselves to them. Yeah, and uh, I guess sort of on how you can sort of be a bit better in, from a comms point of view, um, distinctiveness is, is something that we're, we're always going to preach, um, whether it's COVID, recession or not, is one of the sort of the most important things for making uh, marketing and advertising successful. Um, I think we're sort of seeing a lot, and I'm sure quite a few of you will have seen that super cut of COVID ads going around that, that sort of makes the point that um, everything's a little bit the same in the, in the first sort of tranche of adverts that came out. Um, I'm not going to sort of sit and, and, and bash those because there's actually some good debate on that and some really nice articles written by like the BBH and the Leaf Agency on why Actually, some of those are, are better than the supercut might make you think. Um, it, in, like we are all in the same boat, as Andrew said, or the same storm at least. Um, so we're all a bit closer in terms of our motivations, our needs uh, at the moment in this sort of weird 
equaliser of a lockdown situation. Um, so it does sort of follow that a lot of ads should be a bit more similar, should be a bit more human. And certainly that, that idea of a nicer tone is something that everyone does seem to be taking on board um, through this crisis. Um, but it's still clear that some brands are doing that better than others. They're doing it with a bit more relevancy, a bit more distinctiveness. Um, some of that is luck. It's because like BT, you are, you're just in the right market for it at the time. And some of it is a little bit more creative, a little bit more thinking. I really like the, the stuff that Budweiser do, did re, revamping their was at um, stuff. Um, I think just that nod to nostalgia, that nod to um, sort of how things were before this um, uh, is really quite nice as well. And something that, that seems to be resonating a lot more with people because who really wants to talk about our lives at the moment um, and, and even to an extent the future. Um, and Lidl as well doing some, some quite nice stuff, which is, is less just brand purposey, we're here for you, and more what is sort of right for them and saying, we're going to give you stuff you need, we're going to give you stuff you like. Um, I think one of the best examples I've seen was, um, was Durex, um, really sort of pivoting off that, that cultural insight that everyone's talking about the new normal, going back to normal, not going back to normal, the new never next normal sort of marketing gump, I guess you're hearing quite a lot. And they've put their own spin on it from a purpose point of view. They're saying, actually, why, don't, why do we have to go back to normal? There's some elements of normal which are bad. Can we use this as an opportunity to communicate how we'd like to make that better? And it works for them because they've communicated on these topics before. They've talked about STIs. They've talked about um, the shame of uh, women carrying condoms before, but they put it within the context. And I think that's, that's a really nice way of doing it. And the more brands that we see doing that, the, the better those comms are going to hit home with, with consumers. Um, and then sort of, that's all sort of big, long-term macro purposey level. But actually, like we know we're going to have to be responsive at a bit more of a micro level. So our eighth piece of advice is move fast, but get that timing right. Um, we are already seeing uh, entering the phase where a lot of countries are starting to come out of lockdown. New Zealand coming out um, just yesterday, I think. And um, I saw they had a sort of um, cues for the barbers at midnight. Um, and I can sort of understand that as someone who's getting... Uh, a few more comments from colleagues about my unruly mop. Um, but yeah, it's, it's quite interesting to sort of see um, how, how that's happening. Bundesliga starts tomorrow if you're a football fan. Um, but brands are going to have to take advantage of these and they're going to have to be ready to take advantage of those. In that sort of barbers example, um, barbers aren't going to, they, they've lost in the short term for sure. Um, they're not going to gain um, any more than really anyone else in, in the long term, but they will have that small moment of boom um, where people need haircuts. They're not, <laughs> hair isn't growing any quicker, but people will need haircuts in that one moment. Um, and that's going to happen for a lot of different categories and a lot of different brands. And really, the, the impetus there is not about marketing, it's about capacity. It's just about uh, anticipating those small moments and making sure that you have the capacity there to deal with it um, or that you're, you're communicating uh, enough to get the people in uh, to sort of take advantage of that. Um, so we don't really know whether this recession is going to be V-shaped as, as it was initially predicted or um, inverse square root as Martin Sorrell somewhat perplexingly has suggested or whether it's going to be a lot longer but we do know there are going to be these little moments that are going to be different for every category for every brand um, but we need to take advantage of them and we need to get that timing right in both a business sense and a common sense. And a part of that process once you get that message right once you get good advice on timing and um, there's an observation that we've made and quite a few other consultancies have made that there's no good running an amazing relaunch campaign with an absolutely incredible strategy, perfectly positioned, perfectly targeted with a great message, if you cannot fulfill it. And um, so there's an, op there's an impetus there to make this broader than just a COVID-19 relaunch strategy, or even a marketing strategy, or even a brand strategy. Truth is, 
business strategies work better because they integrate across departments. And if, if you're sitting there nodding and thinking that's obvious, that's brilliant. That means you're an integrated business. An awful lot of marketing teams find that they are an island and they do work within themselves and they make strategies and they sit in keynotes and they live in folders on, on their desktop. And so particularly now, as we move through the next few months and that, that relaunch, which is going to be so much more important than a normal autumn, winter seasonal campaign, it's gonna be business critical. Um, we strongly suggest that particularly as now businesses are quite fractured with furlough, you've got to be connecting departments together to ensure that uh, your whole or that either you or your clients whole organization can respond as one. Um, a good example of that was when supermarkets suddenly kicked back into life. Um, Amazon saw it coming. We mentioned Amazon twice now, unfortunately. Um, they saw it coming. They scaled up. Uh, Tesco's did as well um, in terms of their distribution. They scaled up in terms of their their in terms of their, their product lines. Akaido didn't. And Waitrose invested a heck of a lot of money. In fact, John Lewis were banking on Waitrose to hold up John Lewis. John Lewis uh, and Waitrose got everything ready, but Akaido were not ready because they were not in the room. And that's and now they've re rebounded and they're doing a great job. You have to connect things up. So a part of our process and a part of the things that we are recommending to people is we hold workshops, not, I mean, yeah, a written brief is great, but a workshop is better, but don't make it a marketing workshop. You have to get your finance director in there to give you exact cash flow projections as to how much you can afford. You have to get distribution in the room. You have to get product and NPD in the room. You can't do, you can't do innovation without them. So these connected conversations is the only way that really we recommend doing a strategy over the next few months. It's not a marketing strategy, really. It's a business strategy. And the final of the 10 for all you digital marketers out there will be like uh, marketing lesson 101. Uh, apologies to that. But, but boy, fail fast um, is, a, is a key, key theme over the next six months. Um, for those who aren't aware of it, the idea is that you, you're, you're, you're better not putting all your chips on red and then failing big. Uh, particularly now in a digital world, you're better making small incremental changes and you're learning from them every single time. And then once you get a good understanding as to what converts and what is effective, then you potentially bet big. Um, that's always been the case. Fail fast has always been a good basis of marketing. Right now, for an awful lot of you and an awful lot of your clients, the stakes have never been higher. It could potentially be the make or break of a company and their cash flow. So we do not, we cannot advise businesses to bet everything on something that might not work, particularly, particularly as campaigns are expensive and you're not going to spend money on a campaign. There's sometimes no point doing it. Um, so there's an incremental refinement stage that has to be worked into this, that you need to experiment, you need to A, B, and particularly on online conversion. If, you, if your business model was big above the line campaigns, get them through the door, sell them trainers, then okay, that, you know, digital conversion plays a slightly smaller role. Right now, as we all know, digital sales are much more important proportionally if you have that, if, if you're that type of business. And so what we've noticed is, a client came to us um, quite early on actually, it was quite early in um, it was late March, they came to us with a very specific brief, which was, you need, we need your help on user experience now. We need your help on conversion now. It, this is all the stuff that we know we should have done two years ago, but now we really do need to do it. And they are already seeing advantages. They're a whiskey client. They're already seeing that conversion coming through. So if ever user experience, conversion, and testing to make these little mistakes was important, this summer is the time to do that. So those... Uh, those were 10 tips, advices that, that we've, that we've uh, worked through in our heads to try and, to try and give some worthy advice um, to our clients. And um, what, we've, what we're going to be offering, and the reason we're sharing this is that we're sharing this because advice should be shared across everybody because it's, it's, it's in everybody's benefit if everybody does well. Um, 
uh, we are we have framed it into what we're calling a relaunch roadmap. And what just to kind of, and it's likely that if you're if you're marketeers, you'll start doing something similar, or if you're businesses, you'll you'll, you'll probably start thinking about this in the next few months. Um, the idea of it is you need a framework for this stuff because this stuff is really easy to start talking about, or it's even easier to do what Ross and I do, which is read, read PDFs we download from LinkedIn and go, oh, that's really interesting, file, save, disappear. It's much harder to get that into a logical plan of action, which then you can take and share with your colleagues, your bosses, or your uh, employees. And so, and the point of that framework is it brings together those stakeholders and gets them in the room and gets them talking about audience understanding, gets them talking about the sector, gets them talking about innovation and gets them talking about when and how you are going to launch because you have to do it because you have to accelerate. Um, and the principles of this framework, um, they work really for any business. All the stuff that we've just talked you through, they could apply if you're worth a billion, they could apply if you're worth 100,000 really. But we think they're particularly important for kind of medium sized to small to medium sized businesses who maybe have had their teams particularly cut back due to furlough. So they're understaffed, which means they're overworked. Um, and who are at a point where, may, you know, if you're Google, you have a team of strategists and researchers that are probably way ahead of all of us. But if you are, um, and we work with Google, we know that, but if you, if you are a medium size, there are moments of fear and there are moments of anxiety, as Andrew was talking about, where you, you don't quite know what to do, even if it's very obvious. So the first step um, that we are advising people to do in this roadmap is um, we are going to offer people a report which is tailored to them. So all the provisos that we started with at the beginning to say, this is all generic, this is not specific to you, it's at that first stage where we are going to make stuff specific to them where we are gonna do an assessment of the sector, we'll do a deep dive into their audience, and we will do that scenario planning. Um, and I think it's that scenario planning where it comes together really, really well, uh, and it will be particularly framed around uh, to survive versus to thrive, and how you, how you can map that out. Next, we have those conversations like we've talked about. We have those workshops um, where you get everybody in one room, you work out that innovation. Uh, you work out how the business can pivot. Um, that has to happen, particularly depending on what industry you're in, that has to happen fairly soon. This is, the this is why we're pushing this forward now. Um, and it's at that workshop where we're going to advise that you really do need to agree on priorities, strategic objectives, uh, uh, when, where, when, what, where, how, why, how the next nine months are going to work for you. Um, and also something that isn't asked enough is what isn't this relaunch campaign going to do? What, 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 what is another job? It may well be Christmas if that is another campaign. It could, you know, there may be another relaunch campaign in 2021. You have to focus the campaign for it to have any real objectives. And the final thing is we will pull that together into a strategy um, where we will craft a message which is right um, and which is relevant and which is hopefully distinct, hard to promise, but this is what we'll aim to achieve. Um, but it's also tonally right and helps position businesses as being a part of a solution. Um, we'll give some advice on timing and on readiness and on uh, all the aspects of media and campaign planning that you, most of you know well uh, around, around uh, media and around making sure that it is um, designed specifically for them, specific to their individual sector journey. And we will advise on measurement, whether that is uh, whether that is tailored to a fail fast approach, which is probably the right one, or whether even it's just quick responsive wins before a big investment. Um, now, collectively, that's our way that we're going to be approaching our clients. That's the way we're going to be hope, hoping that businesses engage us. That's that. This is essentially our pivot. Um, and we're happy to share it because we think that knowledge should be shared. Um, now, if you, uh, before we head to questions, um, if you wanted to know any more about that, and I know I had to kind of speed through it, um, then you can head to our website at um, madebrave slash relaunch roadmap. Um, we have available, no, we're only so big as a team, so we have availability to do that up to about, we think about 10 clients over the next um, few weeks. Um, 
if it's more popular than that, fantastic, but we'll see. Uh, we'll all have to see about how in demand that is. So, and on that, I will hand over to Keenan um, and uh, the rest of you to see if you've got any questions. Cool. Um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, um, we're just gonna start answering those. Uh, I don't see any in the queue at the moment. Um, but just feel free to drop them in. Yeah, if you if you if you want to, even if anyone wants to verbally ask a question, um, if you, I think there's a wee waving hand thing that you can do. Some where is that? That's down. Uh, there's a little wavy hand. Uh, I've lost um, it. Anyone know what it is? Yeah, I, I can't see it because I'm presenting. <laughs> uh, but there is one down there. Uh, click on. <laughs> it's somewhere. Um, yeah, and we, and we can unmute you. Yeah, you can be on yeah. a video like this. Yeah, but if you have any questions, you know, don't be scared to ask them. Um, we've all got questions running around, you know, even if it's not completely related to just what we've been talking about. If you have other questions that you think that we can answer, we will do if we can. And if we cannot, we will not. Yeah. Uh, looks like there's one here from Anna Cormos. Um, so she's asking for any advice for B2B businesses. I have a, I don't know about you, Ross and Andrew, uh, I have a con controversial view on this, which is um, B2B, B2C, you're all in the same boat. You're all fundamentally talking to people. Um, and for me, in my experience, and I've worked quite a lot in B2B, the strongest B2B businesses act like a B2C company. <laughs> so, um, in a very cheesy way, I once heard it, Put was there's no such thing as B to B or B to C, only B to me, which uh, you'll never hear me write down. But uh, <laughs> your point, which is to say, yes, okay, your individual sector journey may well be different um, if you're in a B to B setting, but fundamentally, the fundamentals of brand of communications are still very much true. And I think those ten we work through would be very relevant. Um, so I would say it depends on what your individual business and your individual sector is, but the strongest B2Bs think like a B2C because they're fundamentally talking to people too. Yeah, you've just got to always remember behind every brand, behind every customer, it's a human being. So the sooner you understand that you're talking and communicating to human beings, the better a response of whatever you do. Um, you know, you don't, try not think of like you're talking to a business or, you know, try and think, of, you know, inside that business, you're speaking to a person. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, there's one more here. Oh, it's in the comments section, which keeps jumping around. Hold on. Um, bum, bum, bum. Where did it go? Uh, any specific advice for the hotel industry? Probably tourism. Um, hmm. that's a good one. Ross, do you want to take that one? <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's a tricky question. Uh, I don't know if I have any sort of uh, anything specific off, off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I think to, to, to bail Ross out there, <laughs> something that we, we said we wouldn't do at the beginning of this, and I don't think we should do now, shoot from the hip. Um, if you, this is why one of the first things we said was every single answer is sector specific. And the hotel sector will be on its own journey, as we said. Um, and that, that journey, we don't know what that's going to look like. I wouldn't trust Boris's time scales. I'm sure you don't either. Um, but one thing is for sure that if you then, if you, if, if you do that, if you do the thing that we're saying, which is if you deep dive into that sector and if you deep dive into that region, because it would be a regional impact as well, our hotel in London may well perform very differently to the hotel in Oban. Um, what, what you begin to see is there will be a spike and what you would hope to want to create is to maintain that spike. So the question there would be is, would you, would you if, if you know there is going to be a spike in bookings, um, do you do a relaunch campaign or do you bank that full booking crazy month and instead tailor a relaunch campaign as an ongoing piece of investment to try and increase that surge for as long as it possibly can. So this is an example of how you tailor every single approach to every single sector. So that's, I mean, that is me shooting from the hip, which I said I wouldn't do.
but it's an example of how if you know you're going to be at full capacity, for example, as I'd, I would expect a hotel might be for a short period of time, and you know that maybe the autumn is all you've got, you might tailor that campaign to be about ongoing content rather than here's the big week, for example. So it's all about sector specific research and being aware of where in the country you are, because again, I'm terrified of one size fits all approaches. Yeah, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and, and try and cover off a couple of questions as one. Um, I think we had a question on, um, we've shared a lot and, and, and do we worry about sharing that in a public domain? Um, and there was one about what sources do you recommend looking into preparing scenario planning? Um, I would link the two by saying, yeah, I, like I think um, a, lot, a lot of businesses do, do, sh do share their thoughts and, and share their opinions and it doesn't seem to harm them, to be honest. I think uh, Andrew might have more to say uh, about this than I do. Um, but like all this information is out there. Um, all we've done is sort of digest as much of it as we can and try and put it into uh, our point of view. I think there's some great resources from um, the likes of Wark, the IPA. They're always my go-to for um, the sort of the best sort of evidence thinkers. Um, in particular, in relation to scenario planning, there was a great um, webinar from Wark um, uh, with uh, Faris and Rosie Jacob, who are uh, a consultancy. Um, I'd have a look at that. They, they sort of cover it a bit in there. Um, I think, as we said, scenario planning is not something that is covered a lot um, in marketing. So probably a good place would be to look is external sources, like go and, go and look up a theory of it um, and, and the people who do it best. And a lot of those people are not in marketing. Um, you're going to get the best thoughts by, by looking at what other people are not looking at. Um, yeah, and uh, to maybe jump in on the, the knowledge sharing um, part, I think, you know, just, uh, I think it's probably a, a good tip for any business out there, you know, share, uh, you know, I always believe in it, um, you know, I'll probably give away everything I know uh, to anyone that asks, um, you know, I, I really believe in it in terms of an ethos that it comes back to you tenfold. Um, in, in, in many ways and, and you know and they might not be right now they might be in you know a year's time two years time um, but you know at, at the moment I think it's really important uh, more than ever that we share best practice you know as we discover what that looks like and you know um, we're trying our best to muddle our way through this and you know I think by sharing it you know people will build on our thoughts and and, and we'll build on other people's thoughts so um, I would encourage you if you don't already do that in your business, it's a, it's a good thing to do, um, uh, and, you know, and and it, and it can only help to to build on great ideas. Can I just jump back in because I, th I think I've spotted one sort of really important question that I'd like to cover okay. off. Someone asked, uh, anonymous attendee asked, uh, "Is there any groundwork a client should do before they bring you it?" I, I think that's a really important question. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, data. Like find out as much as you can about your own business. Um, I think as we sort of covered a lot there, um, the thing about uncertainty is we don't know what's gonna happen, but you've got to build from somewhere. So start with first principles. What do you know? Um, get into the sort of hard data that you have, talk to talk to customers um, and, and, and just sort of bring, bring what you can. And then we or whoever's doing that work with you um, can work through it um, and go through that process and try and make some sense of it. Yeah, and we, we'll be sharing lots more thoughts over the coming weeks as well. So, you know, if you feel free to attend any of our um, webinars, we'll be doing as many of these as we can. Um, you know, we, Keenan has popped a link to the landing page that has a little bit more about this offering if you do want to work with us on it. Obviously, um, that will be there. But we will um, be building out more resource on our website and offering more, um, you know, more of our thoughts as we, as, as we all work our way through this as well. Um, but I think in terms of time, that's 12.59, and I said we're going to stick to the hour. So uh, I just want to, I suppose, take this last moment to thank everyone for taking the hour out of the day and joining us. Um, it's nice to see a, a whole bunch of you here with us. Um, um, I don't know, are we, is this one being shared after the fact, Keenan? Is this? Um, no. Well, actually, if, yeah, if you've signed up, you should be able to watch it again, if you like. Um, but ah. we're not going to put it out on channels because we're probably going to do another one of these next week. Sure.
Yep. Cool. So, yeah. Um, so you'll be able to have a, a check back on that if you want to look back at any of the slides and and you know capture some of that information. Um, also, if you if you use any of the thoughts here and um, you know and 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 you build upon them and prove them, let us know. It would be lovely to hear you know how how they've worked in your business as well. So we'd love to hear that feedback. And and lastly, as I said, if anyone is struggling at the moment, please do remember and reach out to someone, talk, uh, look for help as well. It's a pretty tough time. Um, but yeah, thanks for for joining us, um, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you on the, on the next one thank you very much bye everyone thank have you. a good day have a great weekend go get that gin yeah. now it's, it's, it's definitely it's definitely five o'clock somewhere <laughs> all right take care what do we do now <laughs> i think we wait we, 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 we can we just wait awkwardly. Oh, we just, let's, we, let's just do the freeze as if we're frozen faces. Yeah, thanks for cut. Do the news cut. things like straighten up your papers as it cuts to it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what you do. Yeah. You ruffle, 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 ruffle some papers. <laughs> so, so someone needs to, to, to sing a theme, theme song as well. Keenan, I'm voting for you. In your I already American did it. Voice. It was just really short. It was just like, da, 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 like that. <laughs> Can you actually see who's in the group? Who's in still in? Yeah, if you've got participants. Yeah. Ah, right. So we've got eleven there. There doesn't seem to be a mass removal. You can just uh... <laughs> sort of. Um, hang on. I don't really want to not stop sharing my screen. Yet. <laughs> not that there's anything sinister in that. And there we go. Although we're still showing one attendee, but no name, strangely. <laughs> oh, Weird. Good job, done. Good job team. So, no, I think we're still, Kieran, we're still showing one attendee on the list. So, what? Who are How's you? That possible? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'll close this down and we'll jump on to Slack, okay? Okay. Well, whoever you are, goodbye.